Good evening, everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Melissa Bowles Terry, and I'm head of educational initiatives here at UNLV Libraries. And I'm just so pleased to have you here to help us celebrate. We are celebrating this year's winners of the Calvert Undergraduate Research Awards. And this is one of my favorite events of the whole year because we get to celebrate students' excellent work, the sophisticated and interesting use that they make of library resources to make something new, to come up with something that hasn't been said before. And um, it's just really exciting to see them use our library collections as a kind of a launch pad into, into something new. So um, it's a great celebration of student achievements, and it's an opportunity to acknowledge that it takes all of us at the university to help support and nurture undergraduate research. And I think that we're just doing a better job of it all the time here at UNLV, and it's really exciting to see that happening. Um, I want to thank the library's leadership, and particularly Dean Patty Iannuzzi, who isn't with us tonight, but whose um, brainchild this award kind of is. Um, and I also want to thank the, li the, the libraries and the university's administrators for their acknowledgement of the importance of undergraduate research. Um, giving undergraduates a chance to do research in the classroom and out of the classroom is a high-impact practice that really makes a big difference on student success, student achievement, and student retention, and it, it gets students ready for whatever it is that's coming next in their lives. Um, so we really appreciate the support at all levels for, for that. Um, I would like to give a round of applause to the teaching faculty who are with us tonight, who work every day to integrate research into their classes. So thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to give a hand to the library faculty who work hand in hand with um, the teaching faculty and work one on one with students and small groups with students to help them get access to the resources they need and make interesting use of them. So thank you librarians. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so. Thanks to those of you who are here. Uh, there are also family members who I know have made this research possible. So thanks to you, big hand. All right, and um, I'll acknowledge the award committee members who managed the promotion and application process for this award. Um, Kate Wintrell, Roseanne Mottola, and Andrea Wirth were all very important in making this all happen. And finally, uh, the students, librarians, and faculty who volunteered as judges this year. Some of them are with us tonight, um, some of them didn't make it, but the work that they did was really hard. We had really excellent submissions, um, 16 different submissions from departments all across campus, and they were very high quality. So I have to tell you, the, I mean, the, the applications, the submissions that rose to the top were really fantastic. The judges were very conscientious about um, reading carefully and making these decisions. So I just want to thank Jory Beck, Dan Bubb, A.L. Carson, Mark Lenker, Heather Lusty, Matthew Murray, Kim Nels, Allison Sloat, Katya Uriarte, and Greg Volker. They um, really did a great job. So thanks to our judges. Um, they volunteer their time and expertise over a really short window of time. So it's about five days between the submission deadline and the judging deadline, and they're reading like senior theses and capstone projects, not necessarily in their area of expertise. So you can kind of get an idea of how that is not an easy job. Um, so tonight, I've said all my thank yous. Thank you to everyone. Um, but tonight is really all about the students, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you all about your work. Um, as I said, we had very high quality applications from all kinds of departments across campus. And I just want to tell all of you that the students who submit their work for this award don't just turn in that final paper or product. We also ask them to submit a reflective essay that tells us about their research process. And it's always very interesting to learn um, how, they, how they used their, uh, their resources. And particularly, we like to see um, what bumps they may have hit along the way and how they persisted. It's always very interesting, and we love to see that curiosity and that persistence in research. Um, 
We also ask students to submit a letter of support from a faculty member um, who supported their research. And that gives us interesting information about how the student is asking and answering a question within the field. It gives us some sort of context for the significance of their work. So it's really a pleasure to be able to to recognize the work of these exemplary students and their faculty mentors, of course. And it's thanks to the generosity and the vision of the Calverts who endowed this award. Um, so we, we really thank them and we thank our library advisory board for what they make possible. So enjoy the reception tonight. That is also thanks to them. Um, and uh, we're going to really enjoy hearing about the research. Um, first, we have the pleasure of having Lori Temple, who is Vice Provost for Information Technology, here to speak to us. And then after Lori's remarks, my colleague Kate Wintrell, who's co-chair of the awards committee, will present the awards and we'll hear from our winners. Thank you so much. All right, All right thanks. So I, I'm, um, I'm here for the provost. I, I know she would love to be here, but she's, so, she's out of town for the day, so I'm acting provost for the day, so you get me. <laughs> so on behalf of the executive vice president and provost, uh, Diane Chase, and the entire office of, of the provost, welcome. Uh, we, we're so excited about undergraduate research and about what it does for the institution. And I'm honored to participate in this event. I, um, it's just amazing the, the kind of work that um, this event actually represents. And, and I'm, I'm really honored to be here and, and really want to thank the Calverts. I mean, this, this award inspires students to go out there and work hard and, and do some really, really interesting and, and good work. And, and they deserve a lot of credit for, for the inspiration that that really is to, to be able to, as an undergraduate, do this work and get this kind of recognition uh, for a job well done is just really impressive. And, and it wouldn't be possible without them. So today we're going to recognize, I can't wait to hear about the research, oh, I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> I, I, I am an IT person, well, not really, I'm a professor in psychology actually, <laughs> but I, um, and I missed the lab, I missed the classroom, so this is really an, a special honor for me because I used to have a lab and I used to have students and I used to do research and now I worry about, you know, networks and email and uh, um, <laughs> so this is way fun. So the, the efforts of these students is a tangible, uh, it's, it's a tangible evidence of UNLV's commitment to moving to top tier. And, and the more that we can get our undergraduates involved in research, the more that our community becomes a research um, community. And it's the undergraduates, it's the graduates, it's the faculty, all working together to build that reputation. And these are the kinds of programs that help get us to be one of the best universities in the country as we pursue that, that top tier. Uh, that top tier status, so very excited for these kinds of opportunities. And it's really fun to see students exploring and creating new knowledge, and you said, you know, on the, on the launch pad of what's available, the wealth of information that's available in the library, and taking that information and, and putting it together in new ways, and learning new things, and discovering new things, and then producing new knowledge for us, um, it's really exciting to watch the students do that. So you said every student that, <laughs> Every student that um, participated in this had a faculty sponsor, a faculty mentor, and it's really, um, I used to do that and that's a really fun thing. And so thanks again to all of those faculty who supported those efforts. It is a really satisfying moment when you're working with a student and they show an interest, you know, outside the classroom, they show an interest in the research, they show an interest in some sort of intellectual pursuit, they want to understand it better, some, something they're really interested in and they want to dig deeper and they want to follow that intellectual pursuit further and, and it's just, it's so cool to watch that happen and to watch those aha moments and those stumbling moments that you have to get through. Watching that student discover their own passion for the thing that they really, really now love. Now, maybe right after you get the report done, not so much. Um, it's a lot of work and you have deadlines and all that, but pursuing that passion all the way through to a final product, that's a really proud moment. It's a proud moment for the student, but it's an equally proud moment for the faculty member who's been watching and mentoring and helping that process along. And those faculty that, that do that kind of work, it's, it's a way for them to show their commitment uh, and their dedication to the intellectual and scholarly excellence uh, for the whole institution, but also for just the, the, the broader um, commitment to producing knowledge that we can all use down the road. So today, we're gonna to celebrate some of the brightest of our UNLV undergraduates, and well, it's fun to be in a room with the brightest, <laughs> it's always fun. Um, and that panel of judges, 
wow, that's a, that's a tough lot of work. 16 of those, short period of time, all good, trying to make those subtle distinctions to try to determine um, which ones rise to the top of the top. Very difficult, and, and, and they had to do that thoughtful uh, review and that careful work. So again, another hand, a round of applause for those judges. I know I see some, some in the room. And, and then finally, to all the students who submitted their, their work, I mean, congratulations. I mean, that's just a big, big deal getting that done. You've demonstrated your commitment to scholarship and, and your passion for intellectual discovery, and you should take great pride in that accomplishment. That is a really hard thing to do with all the other things you have to do uh, as a student. And you honor all of us through your willingness to share those outcomes um, of your effort. You honor all of us um, get to now appreciate and, and enjoy that. So please join me in thanking all of the people involved in making these awards possible, and particularly the winners. Good evening, everyone. Now, we usually announce our winners alphabetically, but we're going to start with Kylie Johnson tonight because she has to leave early because she's taking her last final exam. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, she brought her professor with us. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, Kylie is a senior majoring in history and political science, and she's recognized for her paper, British Appeasement, 1930. Uh, 6 to 1939, the debate between Parliament and the public. It was submitted for her capstone research project for the History Department. Dr. Michelle Toussaint, uh, Kylie's faculty sponsor, described her project as a much studied but little understood policy of British appeasement of Hitler in the years leading up to World War II. And she produced a nuanced and historiographically rich account of the domestic and international context of the failed attempt to stop a world war in the 1930s. Dr. Toussaint also commented on Kylie's sophistication and originality in using a wide range of materials, both primary and secondary sources, including the British Parliamentary Papers, the Winston Churchill Papers from Cambridge University, the London Times Digital Archives, as well as articles from databases such as JSTOR and books from the stack at Lee. According to Dr. Tucson, examining such primary sources allowed Kylie to understand the scope and leadership struggles that faced the British politicians in de their dealings with Hitler. By analyzing key terms from the sources, Kylie was able to focus on the debate between parliament and public over the idea of appeasement. Now, uh, describing Kylie as one of our most promising undergraduate researchers, Dr. Tucson said, Kylie's research raises important questions about war, diplomacy, and statecraft. Kylie will uh, be attending Fresno Pacific University this fall and work towards a master's degree in teaching. Right? Mm -hmm. Kylie. Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Tucson again um, for helping me with this research, for guiding me in the right direction in the first place. I was completely lost at first. Um, I knew I wanted to do something on World War II didn't know where to go with it, didn't want to do something that was too overdone, and she kind of limited me and kind of gently shoved me in a, <laughs> in a direction um, that led me to uh, British appeasement. So um, I'd also like to thank Dr. J. Jack in the history department for teaching me how to write a historical paper period, because I had no idea how to use Chicago manual style, no idea how to do citations, no idea how to read historical sources, and so she was really key in my learning for that. Um, my mom, of course, for being there when I had the mental breakdown about <laughs> this paper, <laughs> maybe have cried a couple times during writing it, but it's fine. Um, and then the Calverts, of course, for tonight, just in general, and everything that they're doing for us. and. UNLV Libraries for having all the exact databases that I needed for, to be able to do this research. So um, a little bit about my paper. Uh, I tracked the changes in Great Britain during the pre-war years, um, looked at the conversation between the public and parliament, um, and it was only really the beginning of my understanding of this relationship between the people and government and also the idea of appeasement. So, 
in a lot of history, there are the traditionalists, the people who think of the very first historians on the subject. And for appeasement, these guys saw the decision makers of the time as like guilty. They were morally corrupt. They had a lot of issues. Um, the old revisionists who saw them as having no other choice. The revisionists who said that Britain was not ready for war. Um, the new revisionists who said, what is appeasement? What are we even looking at right here? Because there's no solid definition for it. And when I was going through my research, I found that there are now many definitions for it. So by the end of it, I kind of qualified myself as a super new revisionist. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm taking these definitions from all these different historians, and I'm trying to find the one that I think encompasses everything, but is also narrow enough to look at this subject that is so heavily studied. Um, and I also was able to kind of combine, analyze, and look at these other historians throughout my, to make it something new. For sources, I use the London Times database. Um, I use this as to show the voice of the public. Um, newspapers are in your house. It's what you're looking at every day. It's what people are getting around, and it's what they're talking about. And I thought that that, was, that most showed what the public was thinking and saying at the time. Um, for the voices of the parliament, I use the Hansard database that we have access to. Um, those are the one-to-one -one conversations between parliamentary members, and if you have spare time and just want to look around, I suggest reading them because they call each other names, and it's actually really funny. You don't think about that happening, but because it is the one-to-one -one conversations in parliament, it was really great. Um, it would have been impossible to construct my paper without these two key sources. These really were what helped shape my paper. Um, Having these two different voices and it was really allowed me to analyze the conversation going on between the two. And what I saw was that um, in the beginning, 1936, the beginning of my paper was that Britain was very focused internally on domestic concerns, unemployment, housing crisis, etc. Um, and as things started happening in Europe, you kind of saw a turn of the public opinion looking towards, looking outside, saying we need to do more. We need to move away from what we're looking at internally and see and help the rest of the world. We need to let Britain get out into the world again. And through the London Times articles, I saw that public opinion changing. And then you could start seeing it change in Parliament. And it was just getting, it got more and more complicated from there. So what happened was source overload. I had too much. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do with it. The paper was only so long. And I had to cut back a lot. But I think what turned out ended up getting the story ended up getting the story across and the paper I think is only the beginning of this direction of the research because it gets more complicated there was debates within Parliament not just between Parliament and the public and it just goes on and on so that's it <laughs> Final. <laughs> All right, our next uh, our recipient is Laura Benedict. Now, Laura is a almost senior, can I call you that, and majoring in anthropology. Her research paper was entitled Polyandry Around the World and was completed for Anthropology 471, Evolution and Human Sexuality. In the beginning of her research, Laura first narrowed her subject turn to polyandry, an umbrella term for one woman having sexual access to more than one man. Initially, Laura went to the library's website. She typed in her keyword, polyandry, and discovered that there were 18,000 results. <laughs> However, as is often the case with anyone who researches, she remarked that many of the results were completely irrelevant, and some were deceptively so. <laughs> As she refined her search terms, Laura found several key articles, and then she used a technique called citation mining, examining the references listed in such articles. This technique allowed Laura to expand her research results. In the final project, Laura used books, journal articles from Academic Search Premier and ProQuest, as well as material from special collections. She attended a workshop on avoiding plagiarism and even ordered a microfiche from interlibrary loan. Okay. <laughs> hit all the bases there. Uh, Dr. Peter Gray, her faculty sponsor for the project, praised Laura's impressive and sophisticated use of library resources. 
After all, she cited more than 60 scholarly references. Dr. Gray said Laura's research shows an, an excellent capacity to read and synthesize a body of scholarly material. In addition, Dr. Gray called her work creative, thoughtful, sophisticated, and one of the most ambitious undergraduate research papers I've seen in my 12 years at UNLV. Laura. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, first of all, to Lance and Elena Calvert for their generous uh, donation. And because of this award, I put more effort into the, into the essay. I learned more. And I, I wouldn't be here without that, of course. Um, to Dr. Gray for sponsoring this effort. And without you, I would never have found all of my 60 plus. I'm glad you counted, because I certainly didn't. <laughs> Um, and I would, have I would have been satisfied with good enough, but I, I, I truly learned more about this subject because of you and the Calverts, of course, and of course to my husband for uh, supporting me always, even when I'm not researching, but <laughs> when am I not researching? I'm always researching. So polyandry, as, as was stating, is the um, sexual access of one woman to more than one man. And when I began uh, this this research, I thought it, that it was exclusively the realm of poor brothers somewhere in the Himalayas. Uh, but I found that there are actually six styles of polyandry. Um, there's the, the fraternal polyandry found in the Himalayas, but it's not represented by poor brothers in the Himalayas. It is represented by brothers seeking to control land and other property. Associated polyandry is practiced by the Aleuts in Alaska. Um, and the second husband is expected to be an assistant to the first, and the wife is praised for her ability to care for both of the husbands. Polycoity is seen in partable paternity, um, which is practiced in the Amazon basin. Um, this garners extra parent for each child in the case of one parent dying. And this reason is also seen in familial polyandry, such as that seen in a poly Pawnee group of tribes in Kansas. This was an intricate system of brothers having sexual access to the wife and sisters having sexual access to the husband. Secondary polyandry was practiced in Nigeria where divorce was not recognized, so if a couple wished to move on, they could still have sexual access to each other as the mood arose. And uh, walking marriage is seen in the Mosuo of China uh, where the lovers do not marry or live together, but they frequently have loving and long-lasting relationships. Each of these marital patterns is just as valid as same-sex relationships, polygyny, or the heteronormative relationships that we see very commonly around the world today. Um, future research could focus on the uh, who practices it today, and I hypothesize that it is found even here in Las Vegas. Uh, thank you for your time and for this award. Moving along here, our next uh, uh, recipient is uh, Brianna Cotter. Uh, Brianna is a senior multidisciplinary major, and she is recognized tonight for her capstone research paper, Prescribing, Prescribing Change for Minority Students, Diagno Diagnosing Inequalities in Science Education in Clark County School District. With sociology and biology as their two main disciplines, Brianna examined the correlation between the significant underrepresentation of racial minority groups in health and science related fields and their overrepresentation of black and hispanic students in title 1 or at risk low income schools uh, dr tim gautier um, faculty sponsor said that brianna applied theoretical and disciplinary perspectives to form a hypothesis that was the product of a thorough and wide ranging research that brings together the work of race and social theorists education scholars, nursing and health specialists, sociologists, and others. In her reflective essay, Brianna said that as a non-traditional undergraduate student and mother of two, 
it was nearly impossible for her to travel to lead, li li lead library. So before starting her research, uh, Brianna used the library's online tutorial, finding articles to learn the correct way to search for library materials. We love to hear that. <laughs> we love to hear that. <laughs> and indeed, Brianna used a wide variety of sources, journal articles, books, along with primary sources from the Census Bureau, uh, the Clark County School District, and the Association of Medical Colleges, as well as utilizing citation mining techniques and survey methods. Dr. As Dr. Gautier wrote, Brianna ex exhibited a facility and level of comfort with crossing disciplinary boundaries and demonstrated a capacity for analyzing, co collating, and synthesizing data that few undergraduate students possess. Her work shows that exposure to high quality science programs increases the likelihood of a student's interest in science related fields. And uh, Brianna hopes to attend graduate school and study sociology. Brianna. Good evening. It is a humble, humble, humble privilege to receive a 2017 University Libraries Lance and Elena Calvert Research Award. Through this award, Lance and Elena Calvert helped foster a culture of academic inquiry at UNLV. Thank you to Mr. and Ms. Calvert for supporting undergraduate research. As a mother of two, leaving my young children to physically visit the UNLV Lead Library is nearly impossible. Thus, I have become very familiar with this library's cutting edge technology and resources available online. By having such extensive resources available at my fingertips, this library has become an extension of my living room during my research process. <laughs> this extremely student-centered library and its staff have been a key ingredient in the successful completion of my research project, and for that, I thank you. The purpose of academic inquiry is to further a field in a meaningful way. However, it is impossible to know where one is going without knowing where one has been. In this manner, our library's powerful research databases have been instrumental in providing me with access to numerous published studies which suggest high quality science education, such as performing hands-on experiments, promotes interest and self-efficacy in health and science related careers. As such, I adapted these educational paradigms and applied them to my study population, high schools in the Clark County School District. My study was designed to elucidate disparities in high school science education within the Clark County School District. The primary goal of my project was to understand novel factors that may contribute to the entry of underrepresented minority groups into science and healthcare professions. Briefly, my research indicates that CCSD high schools from the lowest socioeconomic sectors have the highest representation of black and Latino students, perform the fewest number of biology experiments each school year, are less likely to have a science club. Thus, identifying key disparities in science education between students of different racial and income groups within our own school district. As a parent, I quickly learned the truth in the adage that raising children takes a village. As an undergraduate researcher, I found that the same is true when developing a researcher. Many of my most important villagers are in this room tonight with whom I'd like to thank. First, my research mentor, Dr. Tim Gautier, who provided countless conversations and guidance and was very, provided very constructive criticism on my writing, so thank you. Um, next, my parents, who instilled in me a love of learning, a hard work ethic, and to be proud of whatever I put my name on. My brother Ryan, who was very helpful in watching my three-year-old so I could work on my paper. <laughs> my husband David, who has always been a source of love, support, and guidance. And finally, my two children, Quinn and Connor, who inspire me daily to be the best I can be. Thank you. Our last um, recipient tonight is Claudia Chiang Lopez. And Claudia is an interdisciplinary and sociology senior, and she's recognized for her research paper, Barbie Doesn't Wear Bruises Gendered Images of Anxiety and Avoidant Attachment Relationships in Film. This paper was completed for IDS Capstone course. 
Now, Claudia admits to struggling at the start of her research, finding few resources on attachment styles in film, and then she realized that she would need to examine media effects, attachment styles, and film critical studies separately. And after collecting scholarly journal articles and books on the topic, Claudia was advised by her faculty sponsor to examine primary historical information. So then Claudia expanded her research beyond traditional materials, studied the lives of people who worked in the films, looked at reviews, interviews, films, scripts, and even a Rebel Yell newspaper from 1987. <laughs> a visit to the Urban Studies Librarian Susie Scarl led Claudia to such sources as the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas, a humanities research library that provides insight on the creative process. This center provided a little more esoteric sources, such as a 1957 interview with Gloria Swanson by Mike Wallace. Good. So according to her faculty sponsor, Dr. Kendra Gage, Claudia went beyond the typical undergraduate research expectations and formulated a rubric based on her research and used meta-analysis of films. She analyzed four films, Sunset Boulevard, The Hustler, Sid and Nancy, and Maurice. Dr. Gage also commented that Claudia's ability to take her research and develop her own analysis shows outstanding research skills. And to quote, she beautifully applied her extensive research to an issue that many individuals grapple with and brought to light what has been underexamined. Now, uh, Claudia plans to study for a master's degree in communication uh, this fall at UNLV. Claudia. Um, so, first off, I'd like to thank um, Lansing and Lena Calvert uh, for the award. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm kind of a little shy. Um, I've actually, I first heard about it a couple of years ago when a friend of mine won the award. Um, and so I think it was like a motivator. I was like, I need more library sources. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, I would also like to thank Susie Scarl, um, who helped me over the summer to start shaping it up. Um, it was a project that took about two years um, and took a lot of different shapes before I really found what it really was going to be. Um, and so, I was looking at attachment styles in film and how they're portrayed, um, particularly uh, when women portrayed anxiety in the romantic relationship. Um, I think film um, has been shown to affect how people behave. In the relationships, we learn um, a lot of our behaviors from that, especially like dating behaviors, especially teenagers learn it from it. Um, so that's what I was studying. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Padungpad and um, Dr. Um, Gage from the Multidisciplinary Studies Department. Um, they were my professors throughout this. Oh, and Heidi, hi. <laughs> She's a librarian here too. Um, and um, the library, um, same, I had to go home a lot. Um, I couldn't always be here. And sometimes, you know, inspiration strikes you at like midnight and you're like, oh, let me find out. Um, so I used to use the library a lot at home. Um, and finally, my family, um, their support uh, has been everything and really gave me um, the ability to do this kind of research. So um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and um, help yourself to a few more uh, hors d'oeuvres.